Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Lucas. For those who don't know me, I'm a member here of this church, an occasional preacher. It's been a while since I was here. It was, uh, I think, about six months ago. Uh, happy to be back here bringing you the Word of God this morning as we continue our series on the book of Acts. In fact, it's the fourth time that we're going through, not the entire book, but the fourth season, because we split the book in four seasons, and it's the fourth year that we're visiting the book, and this will be our last season as we look at the last journey of the Apostle Paul and his missionary journeys. So, but before we start with, you know, the context and where we've been and where we were last week, um, I just want to know how many of you have watched the show Lost before? Some of you? Okay, more of you should watch that show. It's one of my favorite shows of all time. I loved it when it was uh, coming out, and for those who don't know, it's a show about this plane crash, and these people find themselves stranded on a desert island. That might not be so desert after all, spoiler alert. But what was really unique about that show is that every episode would jump scenes between uh, present time, the people on the island, and scenes like flashbacks, scenes about their past that throughout the episode you will understand those characters more and more because you will be alternating between what was happening in the present and what happened to them in the past that made them the people that they were in the present. So today we're going to do something similar. We're going to look at a very important encounter between Paul and people who were accusing him of doing something deserving of death but for us to understand not only himself, but also the response of that people uh, to his, his words, we'll have to jump back and forth a little bit in time. So I hope this is not, won't be as difficult as a Christopher Nolan movie, but we'll be jumping back and forth in time. So uh, please uh, stick with me um, as we do it. So we we'll start with Paul. It's, he is in Jerusalem. The year is somewhere around 58 AD. And he has arrived in Jerusalem knowing that this may be his last trip because he knows that he will face persecution, maybe even death, because the religious leaders of the time were not very fond of the message that he had about Jesus Christ. So he joins the church in Jerusalem, he visits the brothers, he brings offerings from all the churches around Asia and Europe to that church. And to please the local church, who were, were still observing some of the Jewish customs at the time, he goes through a ritual purification that has him go to the temple to complete that ritual. And when he gets to the temple, the mob arrests him. The crowd, knowing his fame, accuses him of bringing a Gentile into the temple, which was not permitted, and they want to drag him and kill him, maybe lynch him to death for doing so. Even though he hadn't done that, he hadn't brought anyone to the temple other than other Jewish um, um, believers in Christ. So he's arrested on false accusations, not by the authorities, but by the mob, but just before they get to kill him, the Roman authorities grab him, they send soldiers, and they rescue him from the mob, and, ask, and the authorities ask the soldiers to bring him into the barracks, where the soldiers um, are gathered. So he's climbing the stairs of the barracks, and he's about to enter, rescued from the, the angry mob, but he asks the soldiers, can I speak to the people first? So he turns around, he's at the top of the steps, and he's about to speak to them. He changes languages. I believe he was speaking Greek so far, but he addresses them in, the Bible says, the Hebrew language. It's probably the Aramaic language that they were speaking at the time. So he's speaking with their accent, with their regional dialect, so everyone shuts up and waits to see what he's going to say on his defense. And this time he's not going to use uh, philosophical arguments as he did in Athens for the Greeks. He's not going to use theology and the law to defend himself. The way that he's going to defend himself before the people is with his personal testimony of what happened to him that brought him to be the person that he is today. But before we read his defense, we're going to take a flashback. More than a thousand years before that, we are with Moses in Mount Sinai sometime around 12 100 BC, so more than a thousand years before Paul. Moses has just arrived in Mount Sinai with the people of Israel. They have been freed from slavery in Egypt. Who is this people, you might ask? These are the descendants of Abraham. In a time when everyone had forgotten about God and abandoned uh, belief and obedience to God, God called Abraham. This was about 400 years or 500 years before Moses. 
And he called Abraham and made Abraham a promise. This was the promise. It's stated um, a few times, and this one is from Genesis 22, right after uh, Abraham offers Isaac to God. And this is what God tells Abraham. I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gates of his enemies, and ye, in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So the call of Abraham was a call not only to bless Abraham and his family and his people, but that through his people, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And now this people went from being a family to being a big nation, more than a million people. For most of their existence, they were slaves in Egypt. Now they've been freed by God, led by Moses, and they're in Mount Sinai. And here God gives them, through Moses, the law. Now this law was a series of do's and don'ts to help them, first of all, govern themselves. Because again, they went from a family to a big nation under slavery. They have never governed themselves. They did not have any laws to rule themselves. So God gives them a law that will help them be a people, be a nation that can govern themselves. But also, and this is very important and ties to the promise to Abraham, this law was meant to set them apart from other nations so that they could bless the other nations. At the end of all that law giving, years later, one of the few last things that Moses said to the people in Deuteronomy 4, we see Moses saying this about the law that God gave to him. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the land that you're entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us, whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I said before you today? So you see, when Moses was giving these people uh, the law that God gave him, it was not only to bless them and so that they would prosper and live in justice, but that their way of living would bring people to a knowledge of God. That they would see these people are different and there is something about their God and they would like to know more about this God and believe in this God and follow this God and obey this God. So the calling of Abraham and his people and the people of Israel was meant to bless all the nations with the knowledge and the justice of God. And this is why we have some, they had some laws that we can even say, well, that, that sounds silly today, like they had laws about not using two different textiles in the same piece of clothing. Those were to be symbols of your call to be separate, not to mix your way of living with others. Because that holiness, that purity, was a way of witnessing to God's goodness and justice. It was not only for their sake, it was for the sake of other people. So keep that in mind. It will be relevant in, in, in a while. So let's go back to Paul now. We're back to the present, 58 AD in Jerusalem. And this is how Paul opens up his speech before the people, who again are very angry and about to kill him, or were about to kill him before he was rescued. So he says this to them. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, Jerusalem, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, who was a very famous, respected teacher of the law, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, that law that Moses gave people being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way, way being the name of Christianity in that time. So I persecuted this way of the Christians to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. That was, that was about 30 years before when he was giving this speech. From then I received letters to the brothers and I journeyed to Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished, most likely to be killed. So the first thing that he says is that, I was one of you, and maybe even the best of you. I grew up like 
like you did, and I loved the law. I was zealous for it, and zealous for God, for the God who gave us the law, to the point that I was killing Christians out of so much zeal for the law as you are about, or were about, to kill me just now. So these people who are angry with him for breaking the laws and spreading the, the way, they cannot blame him for having been only a superficial Jew who never loved their way of life, who never understood it. Because sometimes that kind of thing happens. And it's very sad when you see someone who maybe loses their faith in, in let's say, the, their, their Christian faith. And you hear their testimony of how they deconverted. And it's very sad to see that they never really understood it. The way that they speak about it, the questions that they had they were not really answered. And the way that they lived was never really what we believe the Christian life and understanding to be like. And it's very sad because they're rejecting something that they think they know, but they don't know it yet. And of course, we pray that one day maybe they will know the truth in Christ as he is and accept him as he is. But these people cannot blame Paul for having been a superficial Jew that only came to the temple on Easter and Christmas. Of course, they did not have Easter and Christmas, but other uh, festivals. But he's not a nominal Jew. He was the best of them. He knew the law inside out and loved it and had a zeal for it. So how could someone like him that knows it better than anyone else have become a Christian? As you can see, no one's saying anything. They are completely silent. They're eager to hear more. Before we hear more, let's do another flashback. Now, 700 years before, in the time of prophet Isaiah, in the kingdom of Israel. So these people, they now have a kingdom, right? Last time, they were just slaves uh, who have fled Egypt, but now they have a kingdom. It's been 500 years that they have ruled over the land. And have these people followed the law? Not at all. Maybe only at a few times. But many times over, they abandoned that law that God gave them through Moses, over and over and over. If you read the book of Judges, the book of Kings, the book of Chronicles, the story repeats itself over and over. The people become like everyone else. They start pursuing the same gods as their neighbors. They start doing the same things in their lives, loving the same things, pursuing the same things, even doing the same hideous acts as such as sacrificing their own children to the alt in the altar on the altar of foreign gods. And that happened many times over. God would raise a prophet, they would repent, the next generation would again become like the pagan nations. God would raise a good king, would reform the nation, the next generation would again abandon the law. In fact, some, uh, for centuries, they, they lost even the book of the law. That, that was a big deal when they found it again. Um, so these people seem like unable to pursue and love this law for more than one generation. They, over and over and over, they abandoned to become like everyone else. And this is very important to understand because not only were they, of course, doing things that deserve judgment, like sacrificing their children on the altar of foreign gods, but they were failing the very calling of the people of God to be a light to the nations because the light in them was darkness. How could they bless the nations? How could they bless all the families of the earth if they have adopted for themselves the same darkness and the same wrongdoings that the nations were doing around them. So Isaiah is one of these prophets who brings this message to these people. You've been consistently abandoning my law and failing the calling that I have for you. This is what God tells them through the prophets. And what Isaiah says is that they will face judgment for it. And this is very important because this changes the people forever. One thing that should be striking for everyone, anyone reading the Old Testament and the New Testament back to back is that these people hardly re uh, resemble the people that you see in the New Testament. These people that have such a zeal for the law that they want to kill people who break the law, on, you know, even on false accusations. These people, were at, every, at every opportunity, were abandoning the law. And in the New Testament, you see these people you know, holding on to it so strongly with such zeal that, again, they do not um, accept anyone breaking it. So what happens to them is that the judgment comes. And this is one of the things that the prophets prophesy about. Judgment will come about for this nation because of your consistent abandonment of my law. But it's not only judgment. There will be restoration after this judgment. And the main thing about this restoration is that God will send someone, someone who will help my people fulfill 
this calling. And this is the Messiah that was promised by Isaiah and other prophets. We read this text uh, very often during Christmas, but it's very important to visit again because after that restoration, when, when Israel would be uh, rescued from the exile, this is what Isaiah says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It's interesting that in, the, in this verse alone, you see that this Messiah was both a child to be born like any other man, and yet someone to be called Mighty God. We see that this Messiah was both to be a man and God at the same time. And this was key to the salvation and to the fulfillment of this people, of their calling to be a blessing to the nations. This is the Messiah who would make that possible and enable them to be finally a light to the nations. You can see in, in Isaiah 42 that the, that calling is restored and, and uh, recalled again. Isaiah 42 verse 6, I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a life for the nations. Again, it was not only about their own salvation, but so that they could fulfill the calling of being a light for all the nations of the earth. And again, the Messiah was central to the fulfillment of that prophecy. So let's go back to the present again. Paul, year is 58 AD in Jerusalem. He just told them, look, I love the law of Moses like you did to the point of killing those who broke them. So what does he say now? How could he have turned into a Christian? This is what he says, verses 6 to 16. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, remember he was going to bind Christians and kill them. About noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Soul, soul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And when Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, again, another Jew zealous for the law, well spoken by all of the Jews, who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother so, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him, and he said, The God of our fathers, this is the God of Abraham, of Moses, of Isaiah, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, the Messiah, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So a few things to learn from this passage. First of all, how could someone, you know, with such zeal for the law that he would go about killing Christians, would have turned into a Christian? The answer is, he met the Messiah himself. There was no other way about it. That was it. There was no arguments, no, no different interpretations of the law or philosophizing. He met Christ and he could, couldn't deny it. He was called by him and he couldn't say no to the vision that he had and the words that he heard coming from the mouth of Christ himself. This is why we have to share our testimony because those are undeniable. Those are not arguments. Those are just the things that happened to us and that we can say no to. But also we see that central to that conversion were two things. One, he had to be baptized and be forgiven of his sins. And his sins had to be washed away. Remember, he was completely obedient to the law. He was the best of them. He was doing everything to the letter. He loved the law, was, had a zeal for it. And yet, even him, the best of Jews, he had to have your, his sins washed away. Because none of us ever deserve salvation. There's nothing we do, no obedience to anything uh, will ever make us deserving of God's salvation. We all fall short and we all need forgiveness for our sins, which is made possible by Christ who died for us. But not only that, with that forgiveness, he also received a calling to do what? To witness of Jesus Christ. So, and um, well, we see 
very soon that he was uh, sent to the Gentiles. But again, the calling that he received to witness now of what happened to him and his salvation through Jesus Christ is nothing but the continuation of the calling of the people of God, that they should, again, witness of the goodness and the righteousness of God to all the nations. And surprisingly enough, no one in the crowd is saying anything at this point. They are even accepting this, maybe this happened, no one's trying to kill him yet, maybe this guy met the Messiah on the road to Damascus, I don't know, let's see what else he has to say. And the next thing that he says would drive them crazy again. So let's take one last flashback, and now only 30 years, a few years before he received the calling, when Jesus was still alive before, I mean, he is still alive, that one should be. So, but before his death and resurrection, um, when he was still around Jerusalem and, 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 and Galilee preaching and teaching, one of the first things that he taught and did in his ministry was in his very hometown of Nazareth at the beginning of his ministry. Year might be 30 AD, give or take a couple of years. So at this time, um, as you know, if you've read through the New Testament, Jesus often faces opposition by a group known as the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees, as I said before, they are the complete opposite of the Old Testament Israel that was abandoning the law at every opportunity. These people held to it with their lives, and they were very strict about how to follow this law. And it seems like, well, the exile must have worked, right? Because these people are completely different from the people before the exile. Before the exile, they are eager to become like everyone else, and after the exile, they love the law of God. So did it fix it? Did, it, did the exile, did that judgment, judgment help the people fulfill finally their calling? Why was Christ needed if they are now so obedient to the law? Well, let's see what Jesus says to them. He's in his hometown of Nazareth. We read this from Luke chapter 4, verses 24 to 29. And he said, this is to the people in his hometown in the synagogue, uh, he has just told them that he was the fulfillment of the Messiah prophecies. And he says, and people were like, wait, you, like the son of Joseph, how are you the fulfillment of the Messiah prophecy? Like we've known you from, from birth. And he says, truly I say to you, no prophet is accept acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three days, three years and six months, and a great famine came over, all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them of Israel, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, a Gentile, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed. None of the Israelites were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian, another Gentile. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. They didn't want to throw him down the cliff when he said he was a Messiah. They wanted to do that when he said that God was interested in saving the Gentiles. That was unacceptable. And that's why we see that even with the judgment of the exile and the traumatic experience that made these people now cling to the law, they were still not doing, not fulfilling their calling. Before they weren't doing it because at every opportunity they became like all the nations, they couldn't bless them that way. Now they failed to do it because they hated the nations. They hated everyone else with a passion. They, they did not want them to be saved. In fact, they were ready to kill someone that they knew from birth, they knew his family, they knew everyone, they knew him, like they, they didn't have anything against him to the point, all the, up to the point when he said that God was interested in saving the Gentiles that was deserving of death to them because the Gentiles could never, ever, ever be saved. God would never, ever love them. And this is the kind of opposition that Paul continues to face in his own defense. So let's re read again Paul in the last, time, last portion of his defense before the people. Let's jump back to 58 AD when he explains what exactly Christ was calling him to do after he was saved. That's why he says, verses 17 to 22, When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him, Christ, saying to me, 
Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. So they didn't say anything when he was saying that he had been a good Jew in his entire life, when he said that he met the Messiah, that he you know, turned blind and was miraculously recovered, when he said that even though he was a perfect Jew, he had to wash away his sins, which has implications for all these people as well. But as soon as he said, God sent me, and the Messiah sent me to save the Gentiles, that's what he did that deserved death for that, those people. This is very important for us, because in the same way that those people fall, failed their calling, this is how we can fail to do the same. And we are the people of God who have been called to continue that calling. We, not, we might not be son of Abraham, or daughters of Abraham by blood, but there's a more important lineage here. And this is something that Paul himself explains in his letter to the Galatians, chapter three, verses seven to nine. This is what he says. Know that, that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith in Jesus Christ, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So again, when we have faith in Christ, we are now the sons and daughters of Abraham. And we have now the responsibility to continue the calling of being what? A light and a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Because of Christ, the calling that was only for that family and that nation, it has been now expanded to the entire world because everyone can be a daughter and a son of Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ. So why go back and forth and see all these things that happened to these people that brought them to the point where they wanted to kill Paul for suggesting that God wanted to save the Gentiles? Because again, we are that people now. We are directly linked to that people. And our mistakes can be the same mistakes that they did, or their mistakes can be ours. And these are two ways that we now, the sons and daughters of Abraham by faith, the followers of Christ, the church of God, can fail the calling that we have to be a light and a blessing to the nations. One of them is by being like the Old Testament people of Israel and becoming like the world. Isn't that what Jesus warned us about? He said, you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth, but if the light in you is darkness, how can you be light? And if you lose the saltiness, if you lose the taste, how can you be salt? You cannot bless the nations. You cannot bless the world if you become just like it. If you love the same things, if you pursue the same things, if your way of life is the same, if you prioritize the same things, and if your gods are the same gods. Because things like money and pleasure and career and good things even like family and health, all these things can be gods and these gods are being worshipped and sacrificed to in the world around us. And when we join them in that worship and in those sacrifices, we fail to be a light and a blessing to the nations. That's why we have to pursue holiness and purity, not for our sake, but for theirs. But there is a very dangerous thing that again, we need to learn from the people of God and how they you know, change through the ages that once we become you know, observant to the ways of Christ and obedient and religious and faithful, we might begin to hate the world as well. And thus, again, fail to fulfill the calling that we have to be a blessing. Like the New Testament religious uh, people, we can fail to be a blessing to the world because we hate them, because they are too different, because they are too strange, because they are weirdos, because they have different political views, because they speak a different language, because you know all these things can make us hate them and say, I'm not that interested in saving them. Maybe not even God is that interested in saving them. Maybe they deserve where they are in life today. You know, because they haven't been as obedient, they haven't been as, um, you know, they haven't tried, they haven't made even an effort to do the right thing. 
But again, as Richard was preaching, God saved us while we were sinners. There is nothing in us that deserved the salvation that was extended to us. So in the same way, we have to extend by grace the salvation to everyone because no one deserves it. So we cannot become like the world, but in our holiness, we cannot hate the world either. We have to be holy for their sake and love them and pursue them and seek to do the right thing and to do justice and to love God so that we are the witness, this witnesses that God has called us to be in the world. So that people will look at us and say, what's different about your God? I see there is something different in your way of life. Your God must be different than my God. Why, why is your God so much greater? And this is the way of life that we must live for their sake. The core of that calling and that witnessing and that message is again what Paul experienced, that now salvation is available in Christ, that no amount of obedience can save us and cleanse us from our sin, but now, just like him, who in one of his letters said he was the worst sinner of all because he was pursuing Christ to the point of killing everyone who professed faith in his name, even him was extended salvation to by Christ. And this is what we have to preach. Salvation is available in Christ. There's nothing that we can do, but there is nothing that we need to do to deserve this salvation. The washing away of our sins has been offered for free for all of us. And again, we do it knowing well the dangers of, the, of being religious, that we can eventually mix up faith with performance, and maybe you understand at the beginning, I'm saved by faith, but after 10, 15, 20, 30 years of being Christians, you kind of think like, you know, but by this point, I kind of deserve it a little bit, you know, like I've, I've done my share, you know, of good following and reading the Bible and I haven't skipped my devotional time. It's dangerous. You have to always be, remind yourselves and ourselves that we never deserve salvation, doesn't matter what we do. We do as a response and we do it for the sake of others. So look around you. You are the nations being blessed by Christ. Canada, Philippines, Nigeria, Taiwan, Brazil, Mexico. You are the fulfillment of that prophecy given to Abraham 4,000 years ago. You are here because of that promise. And God is following through that promise. And you are the results of it. But now you are also a son and a daughter of him. And through you, he will continue to do the same. You have been blessed by the people of God, and you have become the people of God. So now go and bless the nations. Now, what does it mean to bless the nations? There's a lot to it. Witnessing, doing acts of justice and mercy, loving God and pursuing it. That's why we come to church, not to deserve salvation, but to learn what it means to be the people of God in our world, in our situations, in our workplaces, in our families. What does it mean to do justice? What does it mean to love God? What does it mean to witness? So keep coming, keep learning. But again, you are the fulfillment of that prophecy. So now go and be a light to the nations. Amen.